Discipline is not the sheer force of will that makes you do something. Discipline is the temperament or the strategies or the systems that one comes up with to get to the place that they want to be. The one thing that all great people have in common is self-discipline. No one becomes great at what they do at anything without a strong command of themselves. Seneca famously says, in fact, that no one is fit to rule who has not first mastered themselves. So in today's episode, we want to talk about that. How do you cultivate the discipline, the self-command, the ability to keep yourself in check, to do the things you should do and to not do the things you shouldn't do? And over the years, I've talked to people who are masters at so many different things, great writers, politicians, military leaders, athletes, people who've had to practice this in the real world. I'm Ryan Holiday, I'm the author of a number of books about Stoic philosophy. I've spoken to the NBA and the NFL, sitting senators, special forces leaders, but in today's episode, we're gonna to talk to some experts about discipline and how this, this discipline helped them achieve their destiny of whatever it is that they do. We're gonna talk about the power of self-control and I think you're gonna like it. I always tell people, they're like, I want to be an actor and I want to do this. It's like, the only reason I am where I am in my career or that I have one is because I always made a promise to my young self. I said, if I'm 80 years old or jobless, at least I will have made my 12 year old self proud. Sure. You know, because yeah. this is what I knew. I just had this knowing I had to do. I can't promise you that it will happen when you want it to or how you want it to. But if you love it, yeah, you know, with everything that you are, and you do it over and over and over again, it will happen for you. If you study, if you train, if you love it. And the irony in it is that the love and the joy is in the process of doing it. Yes. That's the most important thing is once you actually fall in love with what you're doing, the outcomes just happen. Again, it seems so obvious, like, okay, there's some stuff that's up to us and some stuff that's not up to us. But then I've, I've sort of taken it as, okay, but when you focus energy on stuff that's not up to you, you're spending less energy on the things that are, are up to you. And conversely, if your competitors are spending time on things that are not up to them, mm -hmm. and you're only spending time on things that are up to you, you have a competitive advantage. And sports might be who is 1% better, right? And over uh, the course of a game, that manifests itself in seven points or three points or one point. Because you do realize the mental game yeah. is the game. Yes. Tom Brady. It's easy to reference Tom because most people have seen his yeah. uh, tryout video and they've seen that he wasn't jumping higher, lifting more, or running faster than anyone. That draft photo of him in 2000, he just looks like a basically a regular guy. Yes, and but you couldn't measure this mm -hmm. or this. Sure. That's what you can't measure. Sure. Because his mental game was superior to everyone else's. Right. This guy, we used to, we'd have to tell him to go home because everybody else, you're begging him to watch film, and he's like, sure. He's living in in, in the in the film room. Yeah. Just trying to study and figure out how to approach the, his the game, and uh, but his ability to to see what the average person can't see. Well, yeah, it's like, let's say you're down. Uh, what is it? Twenty eight. Twenty eight to three. Yeah. You're down to 28 to three, you go into the fourth quarter, and uh, it's not who the stronger quarterback is. It's not who is has the better offensive line, right? It's sort of like who wants it more, who's cooler under pressure, right? Who isn't rattled by what's happening, right? It's, it's all these intangible skills. Everything else is kind of an evened out at that point. Because in, in that case too, you're not even really again, playing against the other team at that point. You're just playing against, are you gonna quit or not? Yes! <laughs> Ryan, you nailed it though. Yeah. Again, the mental game yeah. is the game. 28 to 3 in a Super Bowl. This is yeah. not an NFL game. This is the Super Bowl. Yeah. The two best teams in the nation yeah. going toe to toe. Sure. The only reason I'm watching it is because I love my guy. Yeah. It's 28 to 3. Sure. It's not impossible, but it's improbable. Yes. You understand? And so, but because it's him, I'm not going to bet against him, but I, this is pretty much over. But I'm watching it out of respect. Yeah. 
Well, I mean, what's that thing they say about Tom Brady? The, the one thing you can never do is give Tom Brady a second chance. No. That's a mental, if, if that's not, you don't give Tom Brady a second chance because he's so fast no. or so strong or no. he has the best pass. It's that if you give him a second chance, he'll learn from what he did wrong the first time. You know, he'll make you pay. Like, that's a, that's a comment on the mental game. Yes, and he mastered the mental game early in life. Uh, because I'm telling you, man, he was so confident by the time he left uh, the, the university. Uh, he truly believed, because, I mean, if you've seen anything that about me, you know, I simply would say to anyone, I couldn't teach him how to throw a ball. Yeah. I couldn't do anything except teach him how to believe without question or pause well, you, who he was and who he wanted to become. But I think it's good you brought that up because, yes, his confidence is essential. But that's not innate, inherent confidence that he had since birth. There's a scene in the book you talk about where he's like, my coaches don't believe in me. And you go, well, basically, why should they? I mean, because you have to be brutally honest with folks that yeah. you care about. Yeah. You, you know, and you haven't demonstrated anything and you're worrying about what they think. Yeah. My job, Tom, is to convince you I don't care what the coaches think and yeah. you can't afford to care either. Yeah. You're not here to be liked. Yeah. You're here to be efficient. You're here to be consistent. The single most important word in sports, consistency. Hmm. I can I can get a hole in one. Yeah. Can't sure. do nothing else. But at one time, that's not enough. Yeah. I can't consistently perform at that level. Right. But consistency is the key to who's going to be the best and who's going to be the winner. One of the things I think a lot about and that I dislike, like if I was like, describe a philosopher, he'd be like university professor, turtleneck, like yeah. tweed, you know, uh, jacket with pads on it or whatever. Like you'd think of a weakling. And in the ancient world, like philosophers were people who did shit, right? right? Like they were warriors. They were warriors. They were kings, like Marcus Aurelius Hunts. Uh, there's an early Stoic who's a distance runner, one who's a boxer. Like, and what I love when you really read the Stoic text is like, their metaphors are all sport. It's wrestling and fighting yeah. and running and hunting because they did those things. Those things are difficult. Yes. And difficult things are good for you. And they're good for your mind. That's what people don't understand that don't pursue them. There's, in America, unfortunately, there's this sort of um, intellectual elitism. There's this this mindset that some very smart people have because they're they're very good at certain intellectual pursuits and they look down upon pursuits that are physical in nature because because of this sort of prejudice they have this idea and it's like, I think it's also like a fear of encountering something that you're not good at or something that's going to humiliate you and something's going to make you feel bad it's like they maybe came from gym class maybe came from you know being forced to participate in sports when they were younger and they didn't enjoy it so they have this thing in their head that there's no value there yeah Seneca says, uh, we treat the body rigorously so that it will not be disobedient to the mind. Ooh. I like that. That's good. That's You're, good. Like like uh, when I when I crank the knob to cold in the shower or I push myself when I'm running or lifting weights or swimming or whatever, I, I feel like part of what that is is an assertion about who's in charge. Yes. That's what my friend John Joseph says. John Joseph is the lead singer of the Crow Mags, but he's also done like a shit ton of Iron Mans. I, he has got this great saying about doing an Iron Man. He goes, that's when your mind has to tell your body who the fuck's in charge. That. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, and you hear it with his heavy New York accent. It's beautiful. But that's what it is. It's like, you have to be able to endure. You have to be able to tell your body that this is what we do. And the more you do it, the easier it is, man. I made a video about it today when I was doing the cold plunge. Cause it's like it's a it's so much easier than it used to be, but it's still hard. Mm -hmm. But it's just easy because I'm a, I'm accustomed to the grind of it because I do it every day. So I just get in there or almost every day. There's something to that that's so valuable that doesn't get emphasized enough in our modern day conversations, and it doesn't get emphasized in in media. It doesn't get talked about. 
it's like you have to search for that. You have to search for this idea that struggle is difficult or, you know, like the title of your book, the obstacle is the way like getting through things is how you you build a stronger foundation. It's how you develop character. It's how the mind understands how to manage difficult situations. People tend to think stoicism is having no emotions, but what I thought was so genius about Musashi, he's not only not not emotional, or he's so transcended his emotions that he's able to use emotion effectively, right? And like, I think about this, like when a basketball coach will get a technical on purpose, or like, how does one, if, if you think it's about stripping emotion out of things, maybe that is part of it, but that's like beginner level. That's like, that's like basic. But the real thing is to be able to understand emotions, process them, and then use them, or at the very least, understand other people's emotions and be able to, manipulate's the wrong word, but, but, but use those emotions to help them or you accomplish what is supposed to be accomplished. Yeah, I mean, the, the proper idea to me is sort of a lot of what I meditate about and is in, in Buddhism, where you don't try to repress your emotions because first of all, you can't. We are emotional animals. And if ever you have tried to repress your emotions, particularly in a state of meditation, you see you have n zero control over them, right? They're popping up, you know, it's the way we're wired. So the proper stance is, I'm not going to repress emotions, but I'm going to understand them. I'm going to see them as they occur with a degree of distance. I'm going to see that I'm angry in this moment. I like to imagine it as if I'm six inches away from myself. I don't know why that metaphor come up. But I'm Only six inches? That doesn't seem that far. Well, I'm, it's out this side. It's like here. However, okay. that's like a more like a foot, I okay. guess. Right? And I'm looking at what I'm thinking or feeling from that distance, almost from the outside. And I'm still feeling it, but I'm seeing it as if it's from, um, as if I'm another person. I know this is a strange concept, yeah. but you can observe your own emotions while you're feeling them. And then you, they don't have power over you. Then you can say, okay, I'm angry. Why am I angry? So number one, I recognize the emotion. Number two, why am I angry? Is it stemmed from something weeks ago, months ago, or earlier today? And then what do I do with my anger? Sometimes you want to use your anger. You want to channel your anger. So when you're in sports, if you don't have that kind of drive and that anger, when you're in a bet, you know, when you're down by 12 points. It's like an extra gear. Yeah. You can pull, yeah. There's a little bit of anger and, and even, I don't know, um, hatred or something. You, you just despise the enemy. You're going to crush them, right? You use that emotion. But as Phil Jackson said, if that emotion controls you throughout 48 minutes of a game, you're useless. You drain yourself. Right. You can't control it. You also make mistakes. You make mistakes. So you need to be focused but you also need to be able to use those emotions. That's where I use that metaphor of the rider and the horse, which I've repeated many, many times. Maybe that's another medallion that we could, yeah. could manufacture. No, no, that's a great idea. <laughs> sure, there's some people who they love exercise, so they exercise. And that requires, I would actually argue, less discipline than someone who's like, I won't exercise on my own. So I'm going to create a mechanism or make a commitment that makes me more able to do the thing. Tom Brady does not need discipline to play football. He needs discipline to not play football. Yeah. And we're all like that. We have the things that are easy for us and the things that are hard for us. And I would define discipline as the ability to do the things that are hard for us, even though we don't want to, even though we're not seeing the immediate rewards or gratification for that thing. So I tried to expand the definition of discipline. Discipline is not the sheer force of will that makes you do something. Discipline is the temperament or the strategies or the systems that one comes up with to get to the place that they want to be. I think if you just do one hard thing a day, that puts you in good shape. That's a win, right? One of the things about running is that it's always a win for me. Doesn't matter if it's a couple miles, doesn't matter if it's a lot of miles. What matters is that I didn't want to do it. I know that I should do it, and then I did do it. Today's sponsor is actually the shoes that I'm wearing right now, Hoka. Hoka's shoes were 
Conceived in the mountain and designed to defy the odds, it's an awesome combination of cushioning and support for a super smooth ride. I mean, you just feel it when you're on them. Every day, Hoka pushes the boundaries of innovation and design to collaborate with world champions and then just everyday athletes like me. That's why today's episode is sponsored by Hoka's Mach X, their high-speed plated road shoe, which delivers a revolutionary performance for everyday speed. It's an adaptable trainer that offers the comfort of a plated daily shoe and the speed of race-ready style. They test all their stuff. It's got this p propulsion plate. It's perfectly balanced with advanced foam compounds and it's the ideal combination of propulsion and stability for everyday use. You can join us on the journey, embrace limitless possibilities. With Hoka, run like race day every day. Hoka, the joyful performance brand for every mover, everywhere. I believe that life operates on two levels. And the higher level is the, the muse level, the level of your calling of your work, whatever that is. And the lower level is our material plane. Yeah. And on that lower level is the force that I call resistance with a capital R that's there to stop us from reaching sure. this higher level, right? And if we don't reach this level, or we don't do our work, we don't follow our calling, then we get sick and we do bad things and shit happens, right? So what is the purpose of discipline? Discipline is what takes you to that higher level. That's right. That's why you have to have it. You can't wish your way there. You can't chant your way there. You can't, uh, whatever was that book, The Secret. You can't vibe Manifest your, way, your there. way there. Yeah, you can't. The law of attraction is not going to get, it's bullshit. The only way you get there is through hard work. When you watch the greats, when you see the Jordan, the Tom Brady, the great politicians, great actors, you see a certain level of, of calmness too. Yeah, of course. That, that kind of changed everything for me. The way I put the word on it, on yeah. everything we talk yeah. about, your focus, your present. To me, being present is being extremely calm. Yes. Not letting your emotions, it's Bill Belichick right there. That's why I think he's the best coach in all sports. Yeah. Because of his ability to stay calm no matter what, B big win, he'll smile a little bit and get happy, but a big loss, hey, we got our butts kicked. It's almost the same. You look at his press conferences, where they, where they win or lose, it's the same. And my, a lot of people probably don't like that. And you look at someone like um, a, an emotional coach. There was a guy named Rex Ryan, who's a hell of a coach, yeah. but very up and down emotional. And then you get a team like that and you get your family like that, whether you're yeah. the head of the household, like it's important with your kids, with your wife, with your family, with your business, with whatever it is, to stay that level calmness. Yeah, like an even keel. And that helps, I think that helps creativity. I think that helps you assert your confidence. It helps, everything begins, at least to, for me. Yeah. It begins with that level of calm. Yeah, I mean, my word for that is stillness. stillness. And the, the idea is like, when I think about all the, the best moments in my life, whether it's like performance, whether it's like happiness, like whether it's like beauty, all the, like when I'm like, this was awesome. I wasn't like at an 11. I was at like five. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It, like you'd calmed things down. You were doing, you weren't doing like 20 things at the same time. You were present, you were focused, you were still. And I think the tension though is like to be great at whatever it is you do, you also have to have an intensity yeah. that you have to really want it and you have to be aggressive and ambitious and like, like invested. Like when people are like, oh, does that mean you don't care? No, it's that you care, you, the default is you care a ton and then you have to figure out how to ratchet that down because that intensity will make you not as good as you could be. You'll make emotional decisions, you'll take things too seriously, except like obviously Bill Belichick loves football and he is intensely driven to win. Yeah. So he has to work that, that calmness has to sit on top of that intensity. I think if, if you had a filter, like everything you talked about, all yeah. the intensity, the putting the hours in the presence, everything. And then at that last stage, before yes. you go out on the, before you go out on the stage yeah. or the field or the arena or the conference room or with your family, the last thing to remember is the calmness, it's stillness. Yeah. The idea of being a professional at what you do is is sort of secondary or independent of whether you're getting paid for that thing or not, right? Like obviously being being a pro athlete means like you're getting paid to be the athlete, but like there are plenty of people who are getting paid that are not professionals. Do you know what I mean? Like they, they don't treat it like 
a job or a calling or a craft. They are continuing, maybe because they're, maybe they had different assets or whatever. They didn't, they don't run into that thing that you happen to bump into there early on, which is like, hey, my natural talent isn't enough anymore. There has to be some other driver or system that is going to allow me to continue doing this. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, because you you reach a point where you're, you know, you're you're being funneled into a bucket of all the best players. Everybody that I was playing with were the same me, just in a different state, in a different section of the country. So, there's got to be some sort of separation of what's going to keep you there and what's going to allow you to to keep staying, you know, at the top. And I think it it ultimately starts with passion. I mean, that that for me is a non-negotiable. If you don't have any passion and love for what you do, it's going to be just treated as a job. It's going to be treated as, you know, this monotonous thing that you just go through life, but I mean, I loved playing. That round ball was was my first love, you know, and uh it was never about the money, it was never about the fame, the glory, nothing. It was purely because of the beautiful game. But when you step in between those lines and I always stepped in between those lines, it was like everything else around me just just paused. You know, it was just it was like time stood still and I'm just playing this game and um yeah, it was it was it was pretty amazing. There's a book behind you I was just thinking about when I think of you, one of my favorite books, Range. Have you read Range? I have not. Oh, so it's the subtitle is How Generous Triumph in a Specialized World. What's interesting is like, obviously to be great, the NBA, you have to, any professional athlete, you have to be super specialized, yeah. right? You, years and years, 10,000 hours of practice. But at the same time, you're not one of those guys who, as Kobe was, Kobe's all basketball. You were not all basketball. Mm-hmm. You had a range of interests mm-hmm. and you explored those. I'm curious how guitar, music, language, reading, all the other things that mm-hmm. you did, how is that, in, how did that make you a better basketball player? And how is that sort of informed even now when you think about with your kids? Yeah. I always I always had other things, you know, language, guitar and music came a little later. I had given up. I gave up on it in my mid 20s, early 20s. That's why I, you know, got, uh, went back to it. But like I always I always wanted to get do some things to take my mind off of basketball. Sure. Right. It's it's a lot of lot of flights, a lot of bus rides. So, you know, you need some hobbies. I didn't think of it this way, but um, I had a friend that told me, you know, hobbies lead to greatness. And and I, I always thought that fascinating and, and just that made me look back on things. And, and I did these things just to kind of get my mind off of the game. Sure. Because, you know, I was all in the basketball. That is all I did. But I also had other interests. And one of the things that I found was like, so, for instance, during the playoffs, I would cook the day before a game. I would cook dinner because you have to concentrate on the meal or it's going to suck. Right. You know, so I'm looking at the time, I'm checking the meat, I'm making sure I don't burn, boil the water over. It's a thing that I have to focus on. Sure. You know, because if I don't, my brain is going to start going and then we're going to start thinking about tomorrow and I'm going to be back in that rabbit hole. Which right. Which is fine. Sure. But you don't want to be there all the time. And one of the things I found is that once I start relaxing in my cooking or in me playing the guitar or... <clears throat> In me studying for something in language, I see some weird connection to where I think about basketball. But it'd be like, oh, okay, I could put that to the side. It's like it was this crazy thing of no, you know, no, no judgment. Wow, I never thought of that before. Yeah. This is the move I'm gonna do tomorrow. I got it. You know? Right. Yeah, sometimes when you're thinking about something else, mm-hmm. you create room for your brain sort of subconsciously mm-hmm. to solve some problem that we talked about willful will, you know, if you're, I gotta solve this, I gotta solve this, I gotta solve, you're not gonna make any progress. Yeah, yeah, and and I think um, I read something somewhere, like I, Einstein played the violin, if he, he, if he ran into yeah. a problem, he just played violin for days, weeks, hours, whatever it took. So I always thought, I thought that pretty uh, fascinating, and that's kind of what I started using my hobbies for. Because the grind will grind you down Ooh. if you don't have anything to refresh. <laughs> All the way down, and you can stay in it. You know, I was working with this, um, with a video game team in the Overwatch League. And it's these Korean kids, you know, living in LA, competing. Yeah. 
and they weren't doing too good. They're supposed to be the best team in the world and they weren't doing too good. And their thing is to be like, okay, 18 hours a day. Okay, playing video games. Playing Eight video two- games. Like, hey guys, you know what? Sometimes, yo, go to the park. Yeah. Sometimes you just stink. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sure. I've been there plenty of times. Sometimes sure. you just need to go in there and be like, yeah, get out of here. Go for a walk, go eat a delicious meal, go do something else, get out of here. You know, there is, you know, a, a lot of uh, something to take from, from just taking time off there. That is, you know, you do need time to repair your brain and your body to, to be able to compete at maximum level. When I wrote The Daily Stoic eight years ago, I had this crazy idea that I would just keep it going. The book was 366 meditations, but I'd write one more every single day and I'd give it away for free as an email. I thought maybe a few people would sign up. Couldn't have even comprehended a future in which three quarters of a million people would get this email every single day and would for almost a decade. If you wanna get the email, if you wanna be part of a community that is the largest group of Stoics ever assembled in human history, I'd love for you to join us. You can sign up and get the email totally for free. No spam, you can unsubscribe whenever you want at dailystoic.com email.